Okay, we're on. We are picking it up here in Romans chapter one. We had a question last week about fruit and um, what is fruit. And, you know, uh, Greg, we looked at a couple of things. Probably one thing is evangelism, just people coming to Jesus. And another is to build up the believers, the body. That's fruit. Do you have any other questions beyond that? Like, how would you know that? Or, or what do you think? Um, uh, I, I don't have any other questions. Um, uh, I, I just didn't know if it was an internal or an external if fruit was ah uh, so well let's look at a few things you know when when you don't know what something means then you start looking up there's a couple of ways to find out okay so one of those is to look at a dictionary because we're using language here and we can look at things like a product of plant growth you go well hmm don't know. And, you know, it, it continues on in kind of a botanical way for a while here. Uh, a product of fertilization? Mm, don't think so. Offspring progeny? I don't think that Paul is talking about, I would like some children. Spiritual children. Okay, possibly spiritual children. Mm -hmm. Now, it says here, the effect or consequence of an action or operation, product, result. Okay, so context, the fruits of our labor, the fruits of victory. And you can say, okay, what are the consequences or the effect of the gospel? And you can say, well, you know, even believers need to hear the gospel. So it builds up the body, it builds up believers, but it also uh, makes believers out of unbelievers. So there is a possible, what, what Paul had in mind, let's say. And then the, the phrase after it, uh, some fruit among you, just as among the other Gentiles, all right. Also helps to clarify that the work he was doing was bringing the gospel among the Gentiles. Okay. And establishing churches among those nations. All right. And so that was his fruit, fruit of his ministry. And he is, he says, for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So that is in the context of what he's doing. Now, another thing you can do, uh, again, to get some context, is to take your concordance or take your Bible app and look up the word fruit and see what context. <laughs> wow, I thought I could say that word. Look at the context where it's used. And in some cases, it'll be botanical. In other cases, it will be the result of something. So you look at those things and you say, okay, what is Paul getting at? And then here he says, um, the, the context is about what Paul is doing through the gospel to Gentiles, Greeks, barbarians, and Jews. So that's a way of thinking it out, looking at your question. So I guess let's pick it up now. Here in verse 14, he says, I'm under obligation, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So now we have another word to look up is obligation. What does that mean? Uh, 
Well, let's look it up first. So it says here, he's a debtor. He owes. So let's look up the word debtor. One who owes a debt. That's what is a debt? Something owed an obligation. A state of being under obligation to pay or repay someone or something in return for something received. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Under obligation to pay or repay someone or something in return for something received. A state of owing. One who owes another something. You have an obligation. If you borrow money, you have an obligation to pay it back. Or else what you're saying is, nah, I meant to just steal from you. I meant to just take your money and not pay it back. That's not honorable. So Paul says, I'm under obligation. And this is interesting, both to Greeks and to barbarians. That's interesting. Yeah. Non-Greeks. Um, he owes them something. Where do I put this? He owes it to Greeks and to barbarians and wise and foolish. So does everybody know what a Greek is? They wear little skirts. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> okay. okay. I hope there are no casualties tonight and, at the Bible study. <laughs> wow. Um, you didn't get that out of Miriam Webster, babe. Okay. Maybe, maybe in this context, um, Creek and Barbarian civilized people and not so civilized yeah yes and both of those are not jews yeah not jews so right. uh let's look at that okay that is not a jew barbarians even worse my my um, Bible dictionary says that it is used by the Greeks of any foreigner who is ignorant of the Greek language. Aha. Uh -huh. A barbarian. So it's like uncultivated. Yeah, like Tanya was saying. Now, you know where the word comes from. Surely they're Gentiles, aren't they? Yes. Yes. To the Greeks, all the other languages sounded like so much bar, 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 bar. So that's literally where it comes from. You're a bar, bar. You're a barbarian. It's just, you talk funny. So then he has an obligation to the wise and to the foolish. Now, those are two very different things, right? And Greeks are different from barbarians. Mm -hmm. Very different types of people. Both ends of the spectrum, kind of? All kind of spectrums. Mm. And I guess it's his way of saying everybody. Can we say that? Yeah. And if he said that, somebody would say, well, really? Can you break that down a little bit? He says, okay, civilized and uncivilized, wise and foolish. You said that the Greeks valued knowledge. What? I mm. that square. Yes, mm -hmm. they value knowledge, they value beauty and art. Mm generally speaking. They're also the ones without God. 
though they might have a lot of gods. I want to just look up wise for a minute. Characterized by wisdom, marked by deep understanding, keen discernment, and a capacity for sound judgment. Now, that's a neat person who has those kind of uh, discernment and understanding. That's neat. Now, let's see. Foolish. Other end of the spectrum. Having or showing a lack of good sense, judgment, or discretion. You know, Paul says, I'm not going to leave the foolish out. I'm not going to ignore them and just go after the wise. And he also says, I'm not going to think, oh, well, you know, the wise are so smart, they're going to think I'm a dope, and I'm not even going to try. Hmm. And he doesn't look at the Greek and say, well, he doesn't have any Jewish background. So everything I say to him isn't going to make sense. And then he looks at a barbarian and he goes, well, he's a barbarian. He goes bar, 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 bar all the time. You can't even understand him. So why go to him? And yet Paul says, actually, I want to go after all of them. And the reason is he's got an obligation. He owes them. Now, again, we haven't looked up obligation. I am a debtor. Right? Jesus gave him the, the instruction, didn't he? To be, to go, to be. Say it again. Jesus. Appointed for the, the apostles to the Gentiles, not not to the Jews. True. But everyone except the Jews are Gentiles. That's true. I don't think Paul imagined himself to be only sent to the Gentiles, but it turned out the major portion of his ministry was to Gentiles. He got into trouble every time he tried to approach the Jews. It's true. He got into trouble. He didn't really shy away from that either, did he? We're going to see in chapter 9 Paul's attitude toward the Jews. And I'm thinking now about this idea of obligate. It says to bind legally or morally, constrain. So Paul felt a constraint on his life. It's a force, but it wasn't, you know, like, like actual real chains or being in prison, but he felt like this is something I have to do. I can't ignore this. I've got to do this. But then at the same time, he also says in verse 15, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who in Rome. So he's got an obligation, a constraint. Reminds me of Second Corinthians, where he says the love of Christ compels us. Ah. You know, Jesus loved him. So he says, you know what? I'm going to love people. Now, in First Corinthians chapter 8, mm -hmm. he says... If I don't do this with my, 
if I'm not willing, I'm still got an obligation. He says, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. So he did feel this obligation to people, but also to Jesus. Mm -hmm. But as, as much as he's constrained, he's also eager. And he's preaching the gospel to those who already know it. Isn't that interesting? I don't, I don't think we ever get away from needing to hear the gospel because this is something that we're learning. It's so unlike us. It's not the way we naturally think. And we need to hear the gospel over and over again because it tells us things we need to hear, like you can't fix yourself, but Jesus can. You can never pay God back, but Jesus can. You can never live right, but Jesus can in you. That's good news. That's what the gospel means. Good news. And good news is never a drag. Mm. Now, he's eager because he's not ashamed of the gospel. Now, that is an expression, and I believe it's called litotes. Believe it or not. What what is an expression? Part of the a phrase? Lidates. Lidates. That's how you pronounce it. All right. Lidates. It's an understatement in which an affirmative is expressed by the negative or the contrary. Like, I'm not a bad singer. How so? Lidates. That's Greek for you, folks. Here's what Paul says. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's an understatement. It is an understatement. And what he really means is, I'm proud of the gospel. Hmm. I'm proud of it. I am boasting in it. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written. But the righteous man shall live by faith. It is the power of God for salvation. So now we got to look up the word salvation. Deliverance, preservation, salvation. It's translated in the New American Standard 42 times. So let's look it up in Merriam-Webster and see how theological Merriam-Webster is. Deliverance from the power and effects of sin. Now that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Deliverance from the power and effects of sin. Now, even in Romans, it says the wages of sin is death. is death. So we are being saved from death. Mm. And what else? Hmm. How about punishment? Punishment. Yes. Consequences. <sighs> we could put under that hell. That is eternal punishment, separation from God. Wrath. 
we could say shame, contempt, mm -hmm. wrath. wrath. And that is the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody has ever experienced the wrath of God except Jesus. Mm -hmm. The rest of us just read about it. But we have never experienced it because we would not survive it. Mm, that yeah. is shattering. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Now, it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Now, does believing make it so? Is this kind of like Tinkerbell, where if you believe really, really hard that there are fairies, why then there are fairies? No. You know, there's no power in belief. There is a reliance on what is true. That's what we're doing believe the gospel is we are saying that what god is saying about jesus is true it's about what jesus has done it's not about what you and i do to get saved because you cannot believe in something that is not true all we're doing is relying on what God says, and that is true. So the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And it's to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's why Paul would, when he went to a new city, he would look for the synagogue. And he would preach there first because... All of this is rooted in the scriptures, all the promises, the prophecies. Everything is written down for the Jew. But it's not limited to the Jews. Mm. And in fact, you look up the promise that God made to Abraham, and he says, in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So even when he's speaking to Abraham, he intends that everybody in the world would benefit from this salvation. So to the Jew first because of the promises, but also to the Greek in this sense, they don't have any promises. Um, no expectation from God, and yet God says, hey, you can have this too. That's what the Apostle Peter, Peter learned in Acts chapter 10, that God is not partial to any. So for the one who comes to him in the right way, he will not refuse. And that way is the gospel, Jesus. So Paul is eager. He's proud of the gospel. And it's the power of God for salvation for, which means we're going to get a reason. For in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Now, this is one of those verses that are quoted multiple times in the Bible. Mm -hmm. In other places, you mean? In other places. Oh, the just shall live by faith. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. It is first written in 
Habakkuk 2.4, where it says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. All right. But then it's repeated three times in the New Testament. Galatians 3.11. Now, that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. So there is a contrast between the law and faith. And that contrast is when you are seeking to be justified by law, you are seeking to be justified by your own actions to fulfill the law from works from your works but here the righteous man shall live by faith in the son of god who fulfilled all righteousness now it's quoted again in hebrews chapter 10 verse 38 but my righteous one shall live by faith and if he shrinks back my soul has no pleasure in him so something so important that's repeated often, we need to pay attention to that. So what Paul emphasizes here in Romans is righteousness. And I want you to notice it's not our righteousness. Mm -hmm. He says it's the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm which is completely different. If I were working and trying to fulfill the law so that God would look upon me and say, you are worthy, I will now give you eternal life. That would be my righteousness. But this is righteousness that belongs to God. And it is revealed. What does it mean to reveal? To show? Make plain. Anybody looking in a dictionary? Yes, to uncover. Okay. To make known, to make something secret or hidden, publicly or generally known, to open up to view, display. So the gospel reveals God's righteousness. It reveals how right God is. And the gospel gives us God's own righteousness. I'm thinking of Philippians chapter 3 right now. Here, this is uh, verse eight. Paul says, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That's what Paul's talking about. That's the gospel, not my own righteousness. I give that up. I count it like rubbish. And I exchange it for God's righteousness. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. I depend upon him. And he gives it to me. Mm. So. Mm. It's a gift. It is a gift. The righteous man shall live by faith, and that is faith in 
the righteousness of God, what God has done, not in what I have done. And it is a gift. You don't do anything for a gift. Somebody just gives it to you. And really what you need to do with a gift is receive it. Mm -hmm. And if you try to pay for it, that is an insult to the person who's trying to give it to you. I said, no, I, I don't want you to pay for it. I just want you to receive it. It's because I'm good, not because you're buying it. Isn't that interesting? Now, Rob, yes. What, what does it mean from face to face? Very good. Thank you. The answer is, I don't know. Let's look at it. <laughs> from faith to faith. It's like faith is the beginning. And it's also the culmination of our, of our trusting God. That's how I'm taking it. Uh, in my yes in my translation it says from that is by faith from first to last which is what Joni's just said all right uh, okay so I was looking at Robertson's word pictures in it's a he's a commentator and he's saying it's faith the starting point and faith the goal all right. Well, if it is the starting point and the end point, where do my works enter in? They never do. They never do. So it's not what I do. It's who I depend upon. Mm, to the last. All right. To the last. I don't want to depend on what I do. And that also means the good stuff. Mm. Like, yeah, I'm a pastor. I've preached a lot. I've even written books. But what gets me saved? Is that because I've generated so much for Jesus? And he looks at me and he says, wow, that's great. Come on in. It's kind of easy, you know, when... The Holy Spirit inspires us to do things for Jesus. It's easy to get our focus off on ourselves. Wow, and, and look what, what I did. What we've done, you know. And then we start to feel like, oh, I haven't done anything recently. So then we're all condemned again. Yeah. <laughs> like That's up, down, yeah. up, down. And But we always have to keep reining ourselves back that it's not about what I'm doing. Yes. Even when the Holy Spirit inspires us to do things for the Lord, it's not what saves me. Mm -hmm. It's easy to get tripped up on that. So works don't have a place. I'm not saved because I spoke to a million people in South Korea. And I'm not condemned because I don't share with the guy on the bus. You mean they don't have a place in our salvation? They don't have a place in our salvation. Yeah. Except. Faith without works is dead. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. But that's because I believe. Yeah. Right. Not to get saved. Mm -mm. Right. Everything we do is because we believe Jesus. So all my works done in faith. Would it be fair to say that faith is for salvation and works are for reward? Hmm. Yes, possibly. Think about that. Doesn't mean your works are going to be rewarded, but your faith leads to salvation. Your works don't affect your salvation, but your faith in God brings about good works, yeah, which are your reward. Do you have a scripture in mind? 
Um, Where does your question come from? Hmm. Yeah, trying. I was just listening to what you were saying then about faith not affecting your salvation. And um, it was just that I'd read James in the past and got confused, I think, between faith and works. All right. And we're speaking about it now, so I decided I might try and be wise. Right. Well, they don't have a place. In, well, this is, you know, let's try this again, because I'm, I'm not liking this. Let's try it again. Hmm. Our works don't get us saved. <laughs> but works, says James, comes from faith. Mm -hmm. Evidence. It's evidence. Mm -hmm. Fruit. And it's fruit. It's inspired by trusting God. Okay. Right. Now, you know, the fruit is living and it comes from life. And so these works acceptable to God come from the life of God, which is in us. Mm. And they're different than works done to achieve salvation. Performance. It is a performance, but all the works that come from faith have this in them. Love. Without love, nothing we do is acceptable. So we believe Jesus. We're born again. He lives in us. He leads us to do things that are done in his love. You know, Jesus said that if you give a cup of cold water to a child in my name, he says, surely I say unto you, you will not lose your reward. So it's not the magnitude that we're looking at here. It's the heart. And it's what a person does through Jesus. So mm -hmm. as we think about the gospel, it's about faith. It's about trust. Yeah. How's that? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have a question on that? Okay, come on, say it. <laughs> it just, the discussion made me think of that phrase. And it's two times I searched it in my Bible app. It's two times in Isaiah where it says, he is, um, behold, the Lord will come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him. Mm -hmm. And it's a second time in Isaiah later on, and also in Revelations 22, when Jesus says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. All right. Now, let's just, I'm going to 1 Corinthians 3 here. And he says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. <coughs> and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. 
any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Okay, so that means we need to be careful what we do. Yeah, and we need to build with gold, silver, precious stones. Now, that is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for working with Jesus. Lasting eternal things. Eternal things, as opposed to, Consumables. didn't I do all these wonderful things? Consumables. He, consumables, easily burnable. <laughs> Like the fact that a church is big may or may not be important. It's the quality. The fire itself will test the quality. Is it done with love? Love is costly. But you know, just to make a big church, you can make a big church, but. It can be built on a foundation of this is a cool church. A lot of cool people come. And when I come, I'm cool. So that's why I go to this church. That's essentially wood, hay, and straw. It's burnable. Mm -hmm. Everything that's worth doing for Jesus is going to be costly. I've never found it convenient or cheap. It's just the way it is. Mm. So does that make it a little more clear? Absolutely. All right. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Whoa. Now, this is also a continuation of this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Mm -hmm. For it is the power of God for salvation. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Now, the righteousness of God is revealed, made visible. But so is the wrath of God. Made visible from heaven. And it's against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Okay, we noticed up here that one of the things we need to be saved of from is wrath. And it's the wrath of God. Mm. Now, let's look up the word wrath for a second. Wow. Strong, vengeful anger or indignation. Retributory punishment for an offense or a crime. Divine chastisement. Okay, let's look up indignation. Anger aroused by something unjust, unworthy, or mean. Mean in the sense of small, worthy of little regard, contemptible, lacking dignity or honor, base, a mean motive. Okay, so it's talking about something that is terrible 
but here's anger aroused by something unjust. This isn't God being angry because somebody stuck chewing gum to the bottom of a chair. And this offends his tidiness. This is about something that's really and truly wrong. It's unworthy. And he is angry at all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So we got to look up these words too. It's a word that means ungodliness. Great. Great. Ungodly. It's like lack of the fear of God. Denying or disobeying God. Impious, irreligious. Lacking in reverence or proper respect as for God. No fear of God. And that means no fear of judgment. It means insensitive to God. Doesn't bother me. I will do what offends God. And I don't care. Then there's unrighteousness. What is not conformable with justice? What ought not to be? That which is wrong. Mm -hmm. And in John 5.17, it is written that all unrighteousness is sin. Whatever does not meet God's justice is missing God's goal for us. So, all ungodliness, no reverence or fear of God, and unrighteousness. So look at this. This is towards God. And unrighteousness is toward men. And you remember the greatest commandments. Mm. What are they? Love the Lord your God with all the heart. Love your neighbor. Yeah. All right. So look what we have here. This is why the wrath of God is revealed, revealed clearly from heaven against those who break God's law. They do not love the Lord, and because they do not love the Lord, they do not love their neighbor. The two go hand in hand. And it's because they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Now, we got to look at this word suppress. To hold down. Hold down, hold back. Interesting, no? Hold fast. Say what? Hold down. Hold fast or retain. Quash. It says here to put down by authority or force. Do. To put down. To keep from public knowledge, such as to keep secret, to stop or prohibit the publication or revelation of. That's interesting because we just noticed that the, go the gospel reveals the righteousness of God, and in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. 
Well, this is the opposite of revelation. Mm. It's keep it secret. Or maybe just keep from listening, huh? Just thinking you can do that with some things, but you should never do it with the truth. Okay. You can suppress a secret. You, can, you know, you can keep a secret or information, but you shouldn't ever suppress the truth. All right. It's too important. Well, what happens when you suppress the truth? Get a lie. Hide it. You hide it. You get a lie. People live wrong. Misinformation. Ooh. Maybe you have power over people. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, look at this definition here. To put down by authority or force. You know, we, we have a lot of talk today about misinformation mm -hmm. and suppressing things. And the question is, who's doing it? And there are people who are charging the governments with suppressing truth. Mm -hmm. Of not permitting certain things to be known. And if they are known, they deny them. And it's hard to know who's telling the truth. And it, there are people who are using their authority to use force to keep the truth down, to keep it from being known, to keep it from public knowledge. Well, in this case, what is the truth that is being suppressed here? In Paul goes on and says, that which is known about God. Mm -hmm. It's really talking about the truth of God. Mm -hmm. Who is God? Is he somebody that we need to be accountable to? Or is he somebody that we can just pick and choose? I like all the best parts. I don't like the bad parts. Or, you know, when you say God, you can be very, very generic. Nobody's offended. But if you get specific and say Jesus is God, that is offensive to some people. This You can't, you can't be that narrow because what does that say about everybody else so you can't make people feel bad so you can't say that and that is a kind of using force to put this down somebody else is god well there was there was um, an advert on the buses, weren't there, about there probably isn't a God, so go and enjoy yourself. That right. kind of, that's subtle suppression, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. All right. Now, that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. So again, let's look up this word evident. Because it's used twice here. And it's a word that means visible, manifest. Okay. God made it visible. But let's look up the word evident and see why the translators used that in this case. Ooh, look at that. Clear to the vision or understanding. Clear to the vision or understanding. All right. You brought it into the light. Let's see if I can copy that and see how far I get in this app. I don't know what's going to happen if I do that. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll do this. Manifest. 
there. Clear to the vision or understanding. So God made it clear to them. And it's evident within them that that's what I find interesting. Within us, let's make sure. It's, a, it's the preposition N, which means in, on, at, by, with. And here, they chose to translate it within. So I'm going to look up that word just for kicks mm -hmm. and see what we get. In or in the interior, inside, in one's inner thought, disposition, or character. Conscience. Okay. They have a conscience is seared. All right. That's in chapter two. And we're going to get there. Yeah. So God made it clear within them. Yeah. And you know, there's there's one line of reasoning that says the human body declares that there is a God. Amen. That is the complexity of this body is an indication of there is a God who has all power. He's really smart because it's not possible that these metabolic machines could come about by accident. Well, not to mention that, you know, like the heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19. So we're built to take in his creation. Okay. So we're... We're, in, we're interacting with everything he's made. All right. And somebody wanted to say something? I said it's more than that. We're made in the image of God. Yeah. All right. Experience. So it's both internal and external. Hmm. God has given us evidence inside of us right. and which we know. And he's even given us a conscience. And the evidence without is exactly. is um creation isn't it mm -hmm. and so we have no excuse so no man's got any excuse that's right yeah and that's where we're getting there in verse 20 yes now we'll have to pick this up next week but we're starting to catch on fire here <laughs> it's just very interesting mm. that there's evidence to show that there's a God right there in your own body. And do you know what it's called? It's called DNA. Uh, yeah. Now, it's all code. And mm. it's demonstrated that code cannot arise spontaneously. Code is alone the product of a mind. Code involves things like syntax and proper order and intelligible units of communication. You don't get that from random processes, it's not possible. So just the fact that there is code in every mm. one of your trillion cells mm. is proof that somebody had to write it. There is no other way. Mm -hmm. So on that exhilarating note, <laughs> We're going to leave off. Uh, are there any questions? The end. Let's pray. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are God. And that you have 
revealed your righteousness to us. And we're so thankful that we don't have to try to make ourselves perfect because we know we can't do that. And so we look away from ourselves and how good we're doing and how bad we're doing. And we look to you because you have done something we could never do. And you give this salvation to us as a gift and it humbles us. And all we can say is thank you. And we can say, blessed be the name of the Lord now and forever. Because you truly are good and kind. Mm -hmm. You are righteous. And we praise you tonight. Write these words on our heart. Bless us during this week. And bring us back again so that we can learn more of your good news to us. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good to hear your voice, Lynn. <laughs>